I'm willing to pay. Um, and right in 2000, I remember my first visit to Tbilisi, um, a, a week earlier, a Russian company had bought an electricity grid from, a Russia, uh, from, uh, from the American company. And the first, day that they, well, the first thing that they did, there was a complete blackout. It was a symbol. There was no in, in term, uh, intermission. There, there was no interruption in terms of the power, uh, power flow, but the Russians wanted to send a signal. That's the whole thing about the Russians. They always like to send signals, which in most cases are misinterpreted or people can't see them. But uh, that seemed to be a signal that, listen, we control your power. You need to realign your policy in a way that it won't contradict our policies. Another interesting, uh, another interest that Russia has in the region, in the South Caucasus, is the proximity of the region of the South Caucasus to problem areas in the north, in the northern Caucasus. Uh, to name two of them, Chechnya and Dagestan, uh, these are the major areas where Russia has a stake in terms of uh, irredentism and ethnic conflicts and separatism. But at the same, same time, there are two gorges in Georgia, the Kodori Gorge and the Pankisi Gorge. The Pankisi Gorge uh, is uh, in, um, in the east of the country. Actually, if you look at the map, you have the Pankisi Gorge in this area where Chechnya is, and it is used by Chechens to uh, transport weapons and ammunition and so on. The Kodori Gorge is actually in Abkhazia, where the Georgians do not have any control over, but still it is considered to be an area, a gorge, which is a strategic, and Russia has an interest in it. And here we have South Caucasus perhaps represents the best in or exemplifies or, or manifests uh, the concept of Monroe Doctrine, a Russian Monroe Doctrine, where Russia views this part of the world as its sphere of influence, as the moment its sphere of influence, and it would make sure that no Western, especially Western or no foreign power regions, speaking in Turkey or Iran, uh, would try to exert pressure or try to uh, compete for influence in the region. This being said, let's start talking about the elections. Well, uh, one of the things about elections, and we're, we'll, let's start with Russia, just a quick overview. The elections happened in March, occurred in March, to, uh, March 2nd, 2008. Uh, elections in Russia are, are, are uh, popular direct elections, and if they do not have uh, a clear winner, no one gets 50% plus one, they go on to the sec second round of elections, which no one you know, predicted that it would, it would go. Um, and Dmitry Medvedev, who was the deputy uh, prime minister at the time, um, he was the chosen one. Um, I'm not talking religiously here, of course, but he was the chosen one by Putin. Uh, and he won 71% of the vote. So it was a clear-cut majority winning and no problem there. The major issue here that we need to think about when talking about the South Caucasus is to what extent this is a continuation of policy that Russia has on the region. Uh, we have someone who's going to carry on, Medvedev is going to carry on the policies that Russia, that Putin had in terms of making sure that uh, no one else, no Western power would be in the region, but at the same time making sure that these countries in the, in the former Soviet space in the near abroad would gravitate or would, or would circle Russia in, in the terms of the satellite process. And we, we, if one follows what's happening recently in Russia, it's clear that you have a basically placeholder presidency. Uh, one of the things that Medvedev passed or decided to pass recently was to extend the president's term by uh, two six years. Now it's currently six year, uh, four years, and it's going to be in fact after next election, which a lot of people are saying that it's Putin's way of getting ready, you know, to take a, a sabbatical for four years and come back and uh, be president for another twelve years. So at least from Russia's perspective, we do not have any change of policy. It's the same perspective. It's the same approach that they have on the south uh, towards the south Caucasus. Azerbaijan, very predictable elections. October 15, the last election that we witnessed in the South Caucasus. No contenders whatsoever in Azerbaijan. Ilham Aliyev uh, was the only, um, only, pres only presidential candidate. Uh, most of the other candidates, there were six or seven of them, um, either basically didn't get a chance to, uh, to lobby or to, uh, to run a campaign, and some of them boycotted the, the elections. As a result, you had 87% of the of elected voting in Ilham Aliyev back in power. What's, what's Russia's beef with Azerbaijan, to put it bluntly? Uh, two, perhaps three major things. The first one is the energy. Recently, Russia has been interested in creating uh, a natural energy, or a natural gas cartel. Uh, 
sort of like the OPEC uh, oil producing country versus a natural gas producing country. And it seems that other than Qatar uh, and Turkmenistan, of course Russia is also one, Azerbaijan also holds the major energy gas, natural gas reserve. So Russia is wary about that. It doesn't want to have a raw state in terms of a country where it doesn't have any control in terms of determining the market. So you have the energy aspect. nagorno karabakh between Armenia and Azerbaijan, a major problem. <coughs> it's a frozen conflict, but we saw what happened in South, uh, South Ossetia, which was also a, a frozen conflict, and it suddenly uh, warmed up, to say the least. So Russia uses that as a way of sends, again, send, sending messages to Ilham Aliyev that, listen, yes, we understand that you're trying to export oil outside of our network. Uh, you have the Baku Jehan pipeline, Baku is a pipeline. But other than that, uh, we understand that we give you, you know, uh, we hand it to you that you need some kind of a freedom of maneuvering. But other than that, beyond that, you have to not deviate a lot from, you shouldn't contradict us. And now that they had a war with Georgia, they can always point to Georgia and say this, what could happen to you? And finally, military bases. Uh, Russia is very much interested in maintaining military bases in Azerbaijan. One of the most one is the Kabbalah uh, radar station in northern Azerbaijan, which is a very important early warning system for any rockets or any missiles coming in from the southern part, uh, southern hemisphere or the southern part of Russia. Nothing, nothing sort of out of the ordinary when it comes to Azerbaijan. Everything went as it was expected, uh, no problems. What happened with Georgia? We come to the bullets, part, bullet issues now. Uh, there are many issues why it happened the way it happened. First of all, it wasn't, again, it wasn't, no one was, un, uh, no one was caught by surprise. If one was following the situation as in, in South Ossetia, this was something that everyone uh, was expecting. Because there has been skirmishes, there have been uh, basically conflict and tension between Georgia and Russia when it came to South Ossetia. And this is one of the manifestations of increased nationalism that happened in, uh, in South Ossetia, uh, increased conflict that happened in South Ossetia, was the increased nationalist rhetoric uh, existing in Georgia. Uh, one of the things that we've been witnessing in Georgia in the last four or five years after the Rose Revolution was that more and more the official uh, doctrine or the official rhetoric that the government had was becoming more and more pro-Georgian and Georgian-centric. One of the things happening about two or three years ago uh, was the reinterment of the first president of Georgia, uh, Zviad Gamsakhurdia, who was a, uh, to say a nationalist about Gamsakhurdia is an understatement. Uh, but he was, uh, he was killed or committed suicide, depending on the sources, buried in Chechnya, and his body was reinterred in Tbilisi with official uh, <coughs> ceremonies. Uh, that was the, an interesting turning point to show to what extent uh, the mentality, nationalism, was on the rise in Georgia. The second issue that might have led Saakashvili, Mikhail Saakashvili, the Russian pre Georgian president, uh, to escalate attention was that he was becoming less and less popular among the Georgian. Now this is the classic, basically, um, uh, compensation, foreign policy versus domestic policy compensation, where if you're not uh, scoring well on the domestic front, you try to score well on the, on the foreign front, foreign policy, and you try to basically bring that up uh, and sort of uh, balance uh, your, uh, your ledgers in terms of popularity. And Saakashvili was decreasing. His popularity was decreasing. His former associates, those who were his friends and allies during the Rose Revolution, were bailing out him. And the other thing is that this is one of the biggest problems of Georgia, and our problem as the West, is that Georgians think that they are more important to the West than they actually are. And the West has actually not been clear enough to say, yes, guys, you are important, but you know, we're not going to take your side visiting Russia. I mean, this is something that's, you know, you don't have anything to offer us, except maybe advanced uh, you know, bases and so on, and you know, make our uh, you know, uh, coalition of the willing, or whatever you want to call it, larger, with more countries. And this is one of the things. Rush Georgians have always thought that the West is going to be their savior, is going to always come to their help, to their rescue. And, what for, and one of the manifestations of this was, or affinity towards the Europeans and the West, was basically a couple of years ago, again, Saakashvili passed, uh, uh, made a declaration or passed a decree saying that for 